This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices, episode 312, was recorded on February 24th, 2022. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better serve the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Masterworks, the billion-dollar alternative investment platform that lets you invest in art by legends like Warhol and Picasso for a fraction of the cost. Nomura's head of cross-asset macro strategy, Charlie McElligot, returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll look at some data showing how prior tightening cycles have played out in markets and Charlie's prognostications for what present Federal Reserve policy will mean for markets. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment when Patrick's chart deck is titled, Did the Market Capitulate? Obviously, the big news of the day is military escalation between Russia and Ukraine overnight last night. We've already got a geopolitics-focused feature interview planned for next week's show. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Eric, let's get to that S&P 500. Obviously, the Russia-Ukraine news uh, overnight uh, caused the market to gap down over 100 points. In the, but uh, we had an intraday reversal. And from bottom to top, we had a 200 S&P, almost a 200-point S&P point swing from its lows back up. Uh, wow, what volatility. What does it mean to you? Well, we've seen a complete reversal day in just about everything. I mean, the stock market was down hard before it opened this morning, closed up on the day. Gold had one of its biggest up days in recent history, as long as I can remember. It's actually closed down on the day, if you include 4 p.m. as the close. Technically, the gold market closes earlier in the day, but if we use the uh, end of stock trading at 4 p.m., gold was down by the day being over when it actually touched 1970. Uh, at one point overnight. And uh, same thing on crude oil. Massive spike over $100, fully retracing. And it looks like at least by 5 p.m., the, the final close will probably be either down on the day or flat. So what the heck is going on here? I think what happened is the big move was in reaction to Russia, Ukraine. And then what happened was everybody said, wait a minute, what this is going to mean is the Fed is probably going to back off on its tightening cycle that it's been threatening and perhaps we won't see as aggressive of a tightening plan as was originally contemplated. And I think that's the reason that we're seeing the reversal in the markets. At least that's my thesis for what's going on. Uh, as far as the S&P is concerned, wow, you know, uh, major reversal, as you said, it's actually a green candle in the day. Let's stand by for Charlie McElligot in the feature interview, and we'll get a full briefing on what Charlie thinks is going on and what the tightening cycle is going to mean for markets. All right. Well, let's move on to that dollar index because it was amazing for, for over two weeks, the dollar was just pinned. It can't, couldn't seem to get off that 96 level. Uh, today was a huge breakout. We uh, you know, even broke to an intraday higher high north of 97.50, but uh, started to give some of it back. We're closing near 97, but up, up almost a percent on the day. Uh, what's your take on the dollar? Could that be a big breakout or is that going to also be a fake out? Well, Patrick, the spike above 97 overnight was obviously a safety trade event as everybody was panicking, thinking that World War III was starting in Ukraine. And I think what matters is not the initial knee jerk, but what lasts. And sure enough, what's lasting has not been a move over 97. It's only a little bit of a move up. I am inclined to think still, though, that we are going to see a little bit of trending higher. I don't think this situation is over between uh, the Russia-Ukraine tension. And I think the dollar does have room to drift a little higher here. But as we saw, the immediate knee jerk was not sustained. All right. Well, let's talk crude oil. On an intraday basis, we uh, printed over $100 on that April contract and gave it all back. And, you know, it gives me a memory of uh, 
back in 2003 when the Iraqi war was starting and the, the oil price kept rallying up in anticipation that there was going to be some event. And when, uh, when the uh, war was announced, that marked uh, the top of crude oil and a subsequent and quite deep correction. And when I see the pop and the way it gave it back here, I'm asking, is this a deja vu? Is, is, do you envision something like a buy rumor, sell on news type reaction here? Or do you think it plays out different? Well, I don't know what to make of this, Patrick. It does feel like buy the rumor, sell the news, and it does look like a reversal candle in the chart that would suggest that there's a lot of downside still to come. Uh, frankly, I still think that we're headed over $100, by which I mean staying over $100 for several weeks to months. And um, we're not there yet. And we did see a spike overnight to 100 spot 50 or so. And boy, we're back down to 91 spot 50, perfectly testing the five day moving average on the drop back down and a little bit of a dead cat bounce off of the five day back up to 92 spot 73 as we're talking just after 4 p.m. on Thursday afternoon. Uh, is this just a pause before we move higher or was that a reversal candle that says we have a significant cycle to lower prices on a sell the news event? Really hard to say. I'm inclined more to say that we're probably headed higher from here, uh, although it is puzzling. I don't think that the thesis that the Fed is going to be less aggressive about tightening really applies to crude oil the way it does to stock. And it is interesting that the complete reversal here happened on everything. It happened on stocks. It happened on uh, gold. It happened on crude oil. And why did it happen? I, I don't think that there's really been that big of a material change in the news about what's happening in the Russia-Ukraine situation. Maybe people feared something bigger than was really happening, militarily was happening. Uh, I'm not sure, but it's, it's a bit of a mystery to me. Anyway, let's move on to uh, crude oil inventory, a very significant significant build on inventory, and that could be one of the factors that's contributing to the downside. 4.5 million barrels. Cushing, Oklahoma, though, still drawing down 2 million barrels. Gasoline drawing down 582,000 barrels. Distill, it's 585,000 barrels. U.S. production flat at 11.6 million barrels. So the Russia-Ukraine news clearly has dominated the inventory build, which would normally, a, a build on inventory would be a bearish event, did not immediately result in the big move down, although it did happen not that long afterwards, so maybe that's part of it. Uh, but in general, uh, I'm really a little bit at a loss to understand exactly what's happened here across markets in the second half of the day as everything has reversed its initial moves, almost as if nothing had actually happened overnight in Ukraine. And of course, quite a bit did happen overnight in Ukraine. We're going to have a, uh, a show next week focused entirely on geopolitics. We'll try to get to a little bit more depth there. All right. Well, we got to touch on gold. And I mean, we uh, looked like it was we were heading almost north of 2000. It went to 1970, just a huge rip on this. And uh, just like crude oil, it just gave it all back uh, by the end of the day. Uh, we're trading right around the 1900 level as we came to the end of the day here. What's uh, your take on this? Well, as you say, there was that big spike up, and boy, doesn't that look like a reversal candle on the chart, which would suggest that this was a top and you know we're headed down from here. The thing is, all we have to do is stay above 1880. And for that matter, you know, even if we got down to 1860, you could still make a strong argument that the bull trend is still in effect. So we got plenty of room below the market uh, for a little bit more downside before we have to get worried about the bull trend. This great big reversal candle today definitely is a uh, cause for a big question mark. Congratulations to anybody who uh, sold 1970 and uh, got out at the top. Eric, let's just touch on that 10-year yield. Uh, we started to actually see it come uh, off of that 2% level. We were down uh, even uh, below 190 for a little bit there. It looked like uh, the defensiveness of bonds was coming in. And here we are almost back to 2% again. Uh, it just seems like the yields don't want to uh, give anything back here. Uh, what's your take? Yeah, if I look at the magnitude of how far down the stock market was this morning, how, how much it collapsed overnight, we only got down, what was the low yield on the day, one spot 90 or so? That's not that much down. And we're right back up close to 2%. Looks to me like these yields don't want to give up much ground to the downside, Patrick. This week's feature interview guest is Numera Cross Asset Chief Macro Strategist, Charlie McElligot. Eric, why did we get Charlie back on the show this week? 
Patrick, Charlie has been one of our listeners' favorite guests, especially relative to the stock market, and I wanted to get him back specifically to talk about how this tightening cycle compares to previous tightening cycles and to have that conversation based on hard data, not just on fuzzy thoughts and opinions. And Charlie does a fantastic job. I really encourage everyone to download the chart deck because we're going to be making extensive use of the first couple of charts that really give a perspective of how past tightening cycles have played out. Well, Eric's interview with Charlie is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. Abex Technologies invites you to Smarter Markets new podcast series, Demystifying Carbon Markets. Corporate climate pledges went mainstream in 2021. Moving into 2022, these companies are increasingly focused on developing and implementing plans to turn their climate pledges into climate action and understanding how carbon markets can help them turn their good intentions into meaningful change. For many, however, carbon markets remain unfamiliar, creating apprehension over potential risks. They have many questions. What are carbon markets? What types of projects help reduce carbon emissions? How do I judge the quality of these projects? Will the carbon markets be large enough to meet net zero goals? In this series, Smarter Markets teams up with Base Carbon Corporation to bring you the architects and practitioners of the carbon markets, seeking answers to all of these questions from people who know the markets best. Episodes are available weekly on Saturdays beginning February 5th. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Charlie McGalligot, who heads up the cross-asset macro strategy group at Nomura. Charlie and his team assembled a short slide deck to accompany today's interview. Listeners will find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Look for the red button that says Looking for the Downloads. We'll be focusing most of today's interview on the first two charts, but I recommend perusing the remainder of the short deck at your convenience. Charlie, it's great to have you back on the show. It's been too long. I want to start by just going way back out, high level, big picture here. Uh, we've got this Fed tightening cycle. A lot of people are saying, hey, the, the Fed has no way to get out of this at this point. The market's going to crash. It's, it's just got to be, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent down before the Fed put will kick in and the, the Fed will change its stance. Is that the right way to think about this? And what does history teach us about what happens in these tightening cycles? Well, it's certainly good to be back and speak with you guys. It has been too long. I fully agreed. Uh, look, inflation has been this macro regime change catalyst. Uh, inflation, as I've said, I think in prior meetings with you folks years ago, is the driver of cross-asset volatility, uh, simply on account of what it does with regards to a forced capitulation from global central banks away from the persistent easy money policy, large-scale asset purchases dynamic of the past you know, decade plus since the financial crisis. And what that led to and why the last year, you know, last half year to a year has been um, so tumultuous is that almost all legacy cross asset leadership and positioning and performance has been tied to that, that dynamic where it was all about Goldilocks economic environment, not too hot, not too cold with growth and inflation. And that inflation skepticism or cynicism then allowed for outperformance of duration sensitive assets, the stuff that's uh, sensitive to interest rates. And um, investors parked in long duration uh, assets. They, they parked in stuff uh, from the equity side that could grow profits and earnings without a hot cycle. And in you know, the treasuries or rate side, that meant you know, long treasuries, bull flattening and curves, negative real yield, so, um, which is a very highly speculative environment, which meant persistently low volatility, and long gamma, short skew, all of these dynamics really you know, crowded us into trades that were proxies of the same thing. Long secular growth, expensive, high multiple equities are equivalent to long you know, 10-year or 30-year treasury type of dynamic. And ultimately, it created two, the fact that you know, U.S. is this secular growth engine versus rest of the world being very cyclical, very value. It created this U.S. exceptionalism trade 
And that shift over the past, you know, two years, frankly, right, that from the COVID double whammy of the monetary policy and the fiscal policy response, and then the exit from that period really supercharged and unanchored inflation. And that's and that's where we are right now. You mentioned that inflation is the driver. I know that, as you said, you've been talking to us about inflation for years where everybody else seemed to be in denial. Uh, Most of the institutional guys I talk to say they believe the Fed that it really is transitory and they don't think that we have a new secular inflation. Uh, How do you feel about that? Do you you think that there is really evidence that that it's not secular? seems to me like all the signs are there. I I do think that this has been a perfect storm of... um, of idiosyncratic and cyclical that has aligned, as we've said previously before, I mean, just maximum perversion that the kind of the tiebreaker was this global growth shock in the form of COVID that forced authorities to, you know, go over the top with regards to fiscal policy, in addition to, of course, running alongside unprecedented monetary easing. But What that did create, too, and the sequencing, uh, the kind of escape from COVID over the past, you know, very staggered uh, escape from COVID, is that there have been both supply and demand inputs here that have complicated that picture. Um, I am actually of the view, and I think we'll probably speak to this a little bit later, but that we are pushing into peak inflation territory over these next few months. You are seeing potential signs of inflection across some of those supply snarls. There's major CPI inputs such as the Mannheim used vehicles, which are um, now seemingly um, turning lower. LA, Long Beach port congestion backlog is now declining um, in pretty substantial fashion over the past few weeks. Baltic dry freight index um, down 62% from highs and even you know, the kind of the lagging impact of China's cooling inflation through the global supply chain, you know, where you've had three consecutive declines in factory gate PPI, a recent CPI uh, rollover too. All of that is coming into an upcoming period where you get easier year over year comps. And um, just on kind of the monthly uh, versus the real jump risk that we saw last year at this time, the real escape velocity inflation prints. So the danger here is that, you know, the world has really set up for this hawkish trade and it's been the right trade, the tremendous bear flattening as you priced in more Fed policy, having to be responsive and react to these persistent inflation upside prints in December of 2021. Obviously, you kind of had the final nail in the coffin and this true Fed pivot towards inflation hawks. With that, that meant tighter FCI, tighter financial conditions becomes the pure focus of the Fed. Uh, And with that, you know, this creates an environment where they had to really respond and price in and add in a lot of hiking. Well, the fact of the matter is you're going to get some of this kind of after Q1 softening in inflation. And I think, too, from the demand side, that's when you're also going to begin seeing some of the impact of not just getting the first few hikes under our belts, which will help slow some of that demand in theory. But also too, I do believe that a fair bit of that current kind of strong corporate, strong consumer demand uh, story that's out there right now, and you can certainly see it in things like retail sales and consumption, is that you're actually experiencing too, maybe a false optic, where there has been a pull forward of purchases into higher inflation expectations certainly as it relates to surveys of, of, you know, kind of the consumer, as well as dynamics, right, where there's double booking and double ordering ahead of this persistent inflation pressure. And both of those, too, um, should seemingly see mean reversion in H2, right? I mean, there, that's the, the old, old idea of, you know, what cures high prices is high prices. And I think that would really catch some people flat-footed as we've now established such a, a consensual um, kind of, you know, persistent higher inflation positioning in the market, short duration, you know, as I said, bear flattening and curves, value over growth, you know, as it pertains to kind of traditional late cycle winners, which are, you know, the inflation sensitives like energy and materials. And then short, the stuff that always goes down at the end of the cycle or at the beginning of a tightening cycle, which is the expensive stuff. Uh, and we've certainly seen that. Um, the risk now, as I'm saying, is that is that you get this kind of 
growth is actually a little bit slower because that demand uh, has been pulled forward. And, and this is all kind of projecting out into the second half of the year, as well as this natural kind of organic softening of some of these other inflation inputs that have been previous uh, tailwinds that could actually become um, headwinds. Uh, certainly, without question, there is a, uh, a risk to this observation with issues like energy, right? Crude supply, Ukraine, Russia impact on natural gas, and obviously to this wage price spiral challenge, uh, which could be kind of the next leg of inflation. But if you, you know, really do see this path now where H2, you know, or second half inflation could derate meaningfully, or it simply just slows to the point, which is maybe the worst pain trade of all, where the economic Goldilocks of the U.S. returns. And nobody's really positioned for that, I think. You know, we're, if we go, went back to this world of not too hot, not too cold, just right, and you saw you know, fixed income uh, or, you know, yield sensitive type of assets begin to outperform again when everybody is kind of geared up for the inflation overshoot. That would be, uh, you know, certainly a painful environment for many. Charlie, this issue of the tightening cycle has obviously got everybody's attention. Something I notice is so many people in the world of macro launch into these pontifications where they posit their hypothesis for what this means and how it was likely to play out according to their personal you know, view of the macro world. Some of the guys in your group did something a little different. They said, why don't we, instead of doing that, just go back and look at the data, look at history of when these significant tightening cycles have started in the past. And they put together two charts. The first one is what did markets look like two months after the hiking cycle started? And the second chart is what did the markets look like 12 months after the hiking cycle started? And what I find most fascinating about this, Charlie, if any listeners are not sure which one is which, the one that's a sea of red, that's the two months after. But the one that's 12 months after almost looks like a sea of green. What's going on here and what can we learn about these two charts? Absolutely. Look, we wanted to, we, we think there's a lot of nuance with regards to, you know, all hiking cycles. And the Fed has said the same thing, right? This is a particularly, you know, idiosyncratic, as we previously stated, um, you know, cycle in that this was steroidal almost, right? The accelerated economic cycle, this supercharged inflation overshoot, you know, thanks to this unprecedented monetary and fiscal, thanks to the growth suppression of COVID and lockdowns, and then the growth and demand release of the vaccine and the dropping of you know a lot of these mandates, it's just created this very high speed, high velocity uh, economic cycle that you need to you know differentiate between all kind of prior tightening, all prior Fed liftoffs. So what we did was uh, knowing that this is a you know a front loaded aggressive liftoff, and even though that you know fifty basis point March commencement has seen you know those odds decline, um, I think most are still somewhat in the in the ballpark of seven hikes this year and another you know three or four next year currently on the sell side. What we did was we kind of screened then for prior Fed hiking cycles which saw four or more hikes in the initial 12-month period. And that does give you, I think, uh, a few surprising outcomes, right? And, and I think the, the general takeaways here are that after that initial two months following liftoff, yes, there is a trade down. There is a negative trade down. That's the peak drawdown that we see within equities in that kind of post-two-month window. So in theory, if we're you know fixed and locked and loaded now that March – is going to be the hike, right? I think it's 16 days away that, you know, kind of pushing out into May is somewhere in that peak drawdown. Now, I'll circle back to this later because without question, we are doing some pull forward of this trade. We're doing some major pull forward of the tightening cycle without having yet tightened yet. But what the data showed is that after those first two months, the S&P was down 3.6% median return with just a 25% hit rate. So across those you know prior examples where we've seen you know the uh, four hikes plus in the first year, you know only twenty five percent of those were higher uh, saw higher stocks up to the first two months. The tape has a certainly a defensive posture along with uh, late cycle outperformance from energy and commodities, which goes hand in hand with the reason that the Fed is having 
to go pretty aggressive with a tightening cycle. You're getting an inflation overshoot. Um, and of course, that that goes higher in conjunction with, with treasury yields. The thing that ends up happening, though, if you then start to move out, and we go through this on the, you know, on the 12 month slide, the 12 month forward return slide. But frankly, this starts at the six month point. You begin seeing markets stabilize while yields stay higher and commodities continue to work. But ultimately, out 12 months, it's a very stable regime and almost higher across the boards with all multiple themes, sectors, factors working. You know, that 12 month median return after these four hikes in the first 12 month hiking cycles is up five and a half percent S&P, 88 percent hit rate. The Russell's up nearly 10 percent with the 63 percent hit rate. Growth factor is up 11 percent. Value is up five and a half percent. And, you know, yields are higher. Commodities are higher. Gold and U.S. dollar are all up, too. You know, I do think that there is a notable um, worth going over. If you go back to the you know, the twelve month forward return slide, there's one outlier there where the liftoff is a notable down trade, and it's the January 1973 path. This occurred, and the reason this is notable is because it occurred during an inflation shock. The CPI trajectory was exploding, persistent upside surprises. There was the oil crisis with the Arab oil embargo that happened actually in conjunction with this massive new source of government deficit spending. Uh, in the Great Society, on top of the Vietnam War, and that really saw stocks get hammered, uh, and gold and commodities, you know, exploded higher. So I think that is important to note. The other thing, if you go back to the peak drawdown slide, right? If you're talking about the two months after, um, the most bullish instance was uh, the 1980 scenario. And that's where Volcker began a series of multi-year hikes, right? And actually saw equities markets believe that the Fed would stop hiking uh, as the unemployment rate would eventually move higher. But what ended up happening, so equities traded higher over, over the course of that 1980 scenario as Volcker began this pretty aggressive hiking cycle, but thinking that he was going to stop. What ended up happening is he kept hiking and uh, because inflation kept going. So by 1981, a recession had hit. And actually, the following year, the S&P finished down 10%. So I wanted to kind of contextualize these scenarios where, yes, there are outliers. But as we try to find you know, consistent themes and look at the median returns of these you know, different aggressive uh, front-loaded hiking cycles, that it actually on the margin paints uh, you know, a pretty constructive environment. I would actually, too, like to add one final scenario here which is if we even take this a step further where if i'm looking at the scenarios where you actually kind of look most alike where we stand now meaning that we have had a significant pulling forward of the fed tightening and kind of snapshotted basically half a month out from the first hike the one that mo looks most like today is the 2004 scenario and it looks most like today because um, excess liquidity rolled over. You know, U.S. growth was still at, at higher absolute levels. There was a big rally in gold and crude going into the tightening cycle. And there was even a big flattening of yield curves into it, right? The front end sold off. And you know the, the long end saw this more aggressive uh, hiking cycle, meaning depressed longer term growth. And that's thus the, the flattening. And what ended up happening is that you had a, a you know, again, a big sell off right into the, the, the peak drawdown out a few months, as we talked about, kind of about two months. But it is worth noting then that three months forward, three months after the, after the, the trough, that you did end up seeing a really significant risk return in that 2004 example. So three months after the trough, you had Russell up 20%, EM up 18%, S&P up 11%, value and growth up 13 and 10% respectively. It was a real risk on. So this is just the final example and even further clarification that I think that this particular one has been pre-traded. There's been a lot of consternation. We've seen it in the market. We feel it in the market daily. But I think the fact that we have seemingly pulled forward so much of this tightening without yet having even stopped purchases of assets 
and, and yet to see the first hike still half a month away, that um, that actually portends to a pretty good, I think, kind of T plus three months out uh, for return scenario. Okay, so let me see if I'm assimilating all of this correctly. It sounds like the hiking cycle, which technically hasn't even started yet, is likely to provide a headwind to markets initially. We might expect a bottoming of markets sometime around May or so, but there's also an argument to say this particular cycle maybe is happening at a little bit faster speed than historical ones. A very interesting outlier, though, is if you believe that we are on the cusp of a 1970s size secular inflation, then that outlier were the January 1973 on the uh, on the second chart uh, really shows us that that would be the case if this inflation turns out not to be peaking and it really is developing into a big secular inflation, that would be the outlier that says we're much lower a year from now as opposed to recovering a year from now. Is that a fair summary of these two slides? Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's spot on. And, and, and that's why I, I want to note it. Um, there is absolutely still a part of the universe that believes that not only is the Fed behind the curve, but they're not going to have a choice um, with regards to this now very politicized into midterm elections, this now politicized inflation issue, and um, that even uh, you know you try to control the demand side with with policy hikes and balance sheet runoff, but still this persistent uh, inefficient start stop of supply side issues, as well as you know some of the background noise with regards to uh, what's happening in the energy space, for instance, and the inability to kind of flip on more energy supplies certainly as it pertains to the nat gas geopolitical situation, but also to just the global crude supply and OPEC really not being able to do much more themselves, um, that it does stay sticky and it does stay tense and it continues to trend higher and create more snarls, bleed into supply chains, lean on earnings. And that outlier matters. That outlier is, is by far without question the left tail because the Fed will indeed then be forced to you know, uh, hike us into an accident. Let's come back to that question of secular inflation then, because something that to me seems like it's a little misleading is I think a lot of very smart people are right when they look at this and they say, look, you got so many COVID related pandemic forces that have affected supply chains. A lot of this inflation is coming from that. That inflation, according to a lot of analysts, should peak sometime in the spring, some say February, some say March, you know, in the next few months, it ought to peak. And I agree with that. But here's my contention. I think that those transient temporary forces are indeed going to peak, and you're going to see those big prints of 7.5% or something come way down, but not back to where they were, because I think there is a secular inflation trend underlying all of this. I just think it's not as big as the big inflation spike that's been created by the pandemic effects. Uh, what do you think about that? I, I have to admit, I don't have a lot of data to back it up. It's just the way I kind of feel about this market. Does that jibe with what you guys are seeing? It's, it's similar to um, the debate surrounding uh, the first kind of balance sheet runoff. It's a stock versus a flow issue. I'm a big delta guy. I'm a big rate of change guy. And for me, what is more, you know, and it's similar to credit impulse discussions, right? Uh, where there are inflections. And those terms matter. In this case, the fact that you're still dealing with absolutely higher levels of uh, leading economic indicators, absolutely higher levels of base inflation, you know, that matters. You're, you're still in um, clearly a disruptive environment. You still have, you know, places like China, which is, you know, the world's supply source, you know, attempting uh, a zero COVID policy. Things like that um, will continue to snarl and make this a lot thornier. And it's not going to be a linear path. There are clear signs of easing, as I said earlier, too, you know, with the Trump tariffs, right, a lot of corporates had already done a lot of work with regards to supply chain and improving efficiencies there and alternatives and workaround paths. And look, input prices are input prices, and you see what's happening daily in, in commodities uh, across the boards from, you know, industrial metals to, you know, precious metals to energy. But there is a going to be very uneven softening in this data simply on kind of the reverse base effect. And that change in direction will too then matter because I think 
as it happens alongside slowing growth and that point I made earlier on some of the demand being a little bit of an optical illusion with the pre-ordering and the pull forward of ordering and the double booking and things like that, um, that could eventually give you a double whammy. The market can handle one thing at a time, but you know the occasional death by paper cuts certainly is a phenomenon. And I do think that if you get this expected anticipated softening in data and you know again things like you know owner rents are staying really sticky and don't see those you know coming down anytime soon but the used vehicles which were a, a you know a freakishly large part of the cpi inflation are softening things like that will matter it's going to be uneven but if you get that kind of demand slowdown story and that slowing growth story at the same time that you have um you know, some of these supply dynamics softening, I think that that change of change, meaning just trajecting lower, will feed into a little bit of questioning of such extremely extensive hawkish positioning in the market. And as we know over the years, you know, the positioning is built off of narrative crowding. And I think that'll cause some people to reassess their risk rewards in a lot of these trades. And simply taking profit alone, simply monetizing bear flatteners alone, simply monetizing some of your late cycle uh, longs and, and cyclicals alone or value trades will create potentially as much crowding as there is into those trades right now, create uh, you know, a larger impact than, than folks would expect. The, the third thing that I would say is that and this goes back to this idea of an earlier resumption of Goldilocks than I think the market is positioned for. Say you're getting this inflation softening, say you're getting this demand softening dynamic in the second half in a world set up with um, you know so much kind of long inflation perspective now and short duration. You know that sounds like a really dicey situation. What could end up actually softening that and helping to mitigate that is the fact that uh, you know as we can see right now out of China is that their social financing cram down that they've been conducting as they've been forced to, to accelerate their easing impulse. And we think that is going to even accelerate further in March at the National People's Congress. But you're getting some of that Chinese credit impulse turn. And that really matters, you know, kind of on a six month lag, uh, a six month change that is the social financing. That's the impulse. If you look at it just like a three month lead, so not that far in advance, that's turning up a lot higher. And when you look at that um, relative to PMIs, that's kind of a 12-month lead, but you're seeing a real turn higher in the credit impulse that will ultimately be supportive of global PMIs. And that is this idea that maybe the most painful trade of them all isn't just a, you know, a full one side of the boat to the other with regards to you know, this current you know, long inflation, short duration trade, but instead it's actually going to a place that's Goldilocks which is somewhere in between. Because again, Goldilocks, these people and assets work and assets lead that are more sensitive to duration and more sensitive to um, slowing. And, and, and frankly, um, with central banks, it gives them a lot of slack to ultimately look more dovish than what the markets have currently priced in, which is you know, a rather aggressive tightening cycle. I want to touch on what the right tail risks are going to look like. But while we're still on the left tail, let's just talk about this war risk escalation of the Ukraine and Russia situation. Now, we're recording this midday on Wednesday. I'm sure everything will have changed yet again by the time our listeners hear this on Thursday evening. But, you know, something that just strikes me, Charlie, every war I can remember has gone the same way, which is, all investors panic and say, oh, my God, it's a war. Sell everything quick. And then a couple of weeks later, they kind of come to their senses and say, wait a minute. If you look at history, wars are usually bullish for the stock market. Why did I sell my stuff? Let's buy it back. Um, am I right to uh, – that's off the top of my head. You're, you're the guy with the data. Is it right to think that that's how history works? And if so, should we really be thinking about this Russia-Ukraine situation as a downside left tail risk? Or is it actually longer term more likely to be a right tail event? It's a it's a good question. You know, certainly folks have been looking at analogs from the recent spate of um, of Russian military invasions, uh, where there have been a number over the past decade um, that have been you know relatively short incursions. I think you make a good point in that you know this has been this 
at one point background dynamic. And it's still, you know, the larger market gyration, the larger macro regime shift from a decade of long duration assets to now a very quick reversal of and puke out of those legacy assets into those that are tied to inflation has been this forced capitulation from central banks into a hawkish posture, into a need where they have to tighten financial conditions. That is the larger dynamic that has created, you know, this vol regime shift too uh, over the last over the last few years. Easy financial conditions regime for a decade was was you know very long delta, right? Long underlying exposure, high nets, high grosses. You know, your your books kept going up persistently, so there was like a long skew trade, right? You needed to be um, you needed to be well hedged. Well, what this tightening FCI, tightening financial conditions regime has meant as the Fed became inflation hawks kind of officially in, in December of last year, is that you've basically been um, able to make some money in a short delta, short skew environment. You don't need as much hedging per se because your book is, is smaller, right? The intraday moves have been um, so remarkable and stunning. And I'm going to you know, speak to why that is and in a second here as it relates to your question, but um, that you don't frankly need as much hedging. You don't need to have on as much protection just because you've been forced to size down. As anybody who has a, a VAR risk management model knows, these um, you're blowing through your risk limits, sometimes in up days, sometimes in down days. And that just forces a mechanical shrinking of your gross exposure. So the hedging needs are different. The one thing, and back to your point about Ukraine, Russia, though, is this has become a, a new something to deal with. It's obviously there's a, a risk negative connotation there that it could turn into something much larger. But the larger options, the larger growth of the options that market in and of itself in the background and the incredible intraday volatility, which the options market is feeding into, is creating behaviors where um, you know people are using uh, options, using you know zero days till expiration or one day till expiration options, institutionally, right? Doing kind of some of that stuff that we've seen out of the retail YOLO crowd for the last you know year or two, even dating back to summer of 2020, where you had that you know the first kind of you know gamma um, weaponized gamma trade. And now we're trading these headlines, you know, where we gap down overnight, people are buying, you know, zero DTE, zero days till expiration puts that are creating a ton of convexity and getting dealers short, uh, you know, dealers are short gamma. And with that, they're very short delta because they're having to sell futures to stay hedged and you're closing on extreme lows. But at the same time, and this is back to your idea, as and when there is a resolution to Ukraine, Russia. And that might be after war, and that might be, you know, we're just more posturing and it kind of fades out and, and out of existence. That all of this had all of this kind of trading hedging, where again, generally speaking, people's exposures are lower, but people are now using puts. People are now trading puts. Um, retail and institutions are using options to kind of accelerate moves, same day, press shorts. And on the same time, when we do get these squeezes, they buy calls and that squeezes us to the upside too. But these flows are created, have so much convexity in them, so much hedging requirement in them that it's, um, it then ends up setting the tables, certainly with how much you know, put downside has been trading, that that stuff becomes squeeze fodder, as I like to say, you know, as and when you do get a sustained relief rally, as and when you do get, you know, spot equities beginning to rally away from some of those downside strikes, some of those trades that people have put on with a lot of convexity, um, you know, buying downside optionality, those puts are going to lose uh, delta. And that means that dealers who have been short futures to hedge their exposure end up covering uh, as we rally away. We move away from those strikes, they end up covering those short futures. And that's how you get this really steroidal you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, accelerant type flows from dealer hedging that have been contributing to this larger intraday volatility. Because effectively, since the Fed pivot in December, and we started seeing signs of the market picking that up in November, when really the, the expensive secular growth tech stuff began to first wobble and crypto began to wobble, and that's all kind of the same trade. 
that you've seen a real sticky environment where dealers have consistently been short gamma, short optionality. And that flow at the end of the day, without getting too complex, it just means that into down moves, dealers contribute to further down moves. We contribute to trend where we have to sell more the lower it goes. And on rallies, we have to buy more the higher it goes. That's why we're closing on such extremes. That's why you're seeing such remarkable intraday ranges and why it's been such a, a, a brutal hiking environment. But to your question, ultimately, all of this bearishness, all of this fear ends up setting the table for the big relief rally as those downside puts um, begin to bleed and um, volatility softens. There's a real slingshot of dealer hedging dynamics that can send us um, markedly higher. Let's talk about that next then. Is the scenario basically, it sounds like the, the headwind would, would be strongest sometime around May. Let's move beyond that out to the middle of the summer, second half of 2022. Let's imagine that we don't see 1973-sized secular inflation prints continuing. Inflation's coming back down under control. Maybe the war situation's under control. What could that set up in terms of the second half? Yeah, that's that is a uh, that's a scenario that I think would you know give some folks the willies. Um, look, you're already seeing it now. You know, even on Monday night, the Monday you know President's Day holiday when futures reopened after the Putin speech, and S and P immediately gapped down two percent. Front VIX, second VIX were only up like fifty cents. And what that speaks to for me is that there have been a lot of people in renting VIX futures and trying to hedge their convexity risk, a lot of tourists, as I like to say, and that we are largely uh, in a position now where vol feels tired, uh, sitting at very high absolute levels. And if you get that situation where you know vol is fatigued without a new catalyst, and at this point, the new catalysts are either outright war, which will certainly get vol going again to, to higher highs, but it actually might be a right tail that is required, right? A, some sort of uh, diplomatic breakthrough, uh, some sort of stepping down you know, from the Russian side. Who knows if that's even possible? I'm not going to get into you know, the geopolitical uh, game theory. But if you do get that stabilizing relief rally and you have these vol mechanical drivers in the background that then see dealer hedging forces, you know, negative gamma, you get Vanna, you get charm, all of these forces in play that could slingshot us higher. Well, above there, you have two of the largest sources of deleveraging flows over the last few months, right? Vol sensitive strategies like CTA trend, which are which have gone into the you know outright short side and equities, as well as vol control strategies, which over the last three months have sold almost a hundred billion dollars of US equities. On a lagging impact, those turn buyers as vol resets lower. Vol uh, is a mean reverting asset. It's going to take sustained volatility to support, you know, VIX at 28, 29, kind of in the range of, you know, 1.6 to 1.8% daily S&P changes. If you can't hold that, you know, if you can't hold that, you're going to see real slingshot type flows and ultimately CTA trend, ultimately vol control they become a source of synthetic short gamma, where they are buyers higher. And that then would meld into the macro story that you just talked about, the macro story that we just talked about, which is market is really positioned for incredible persistent hawkishness and persistent inflationary pressures. Well, guess what? Maybe inflation isn't as bad as, as, as we thought. It does begin to normalize. Plus that demand squeeze was a little bit of pull forward. And you get a little bit of slowing there. All of a sudden, the market has to dovishly reprice rates. And all of a sudden, duration-sensitive assets like you know, defensives and tech begin to work again. And all of a sudden, those longs and cyclical value start getting cratered. You know, those types of scenarios where it's a, you know, an equities higher type of a trade, but you're in the wrong stuff. You know, we still know how much of index weight, you know, a lot of these secular growth names have, that could be a really remarkable environment, especially if the macro 
kind of softens in the back half back into that Goldilocks of the past 10 years and people will go back to their muscle memory. And if, if bonds stabilized, you're going to have a, you know, a real whipsaw position there too with, with that, you know, short treasuries paying and rates, you know, bear flattening trade, you know, going to get stopped out if you begin to remove hikes. And, and frankly, it's important to note that the last hikes are really already priced in uh, you know, the euro dollar curve in the first half of, of next year. And by 2024, uh, you're beginning to price in the first easing. So I think the market is starting to get that joke where, okay, we've had a great run. These trades have made me, you know, a fair bit of money from the macro side, you know, paying in rates and, and bearish global bonds and, and long value and, and things of that nature and long commodities. But this is getting long in the tooth. Maybe I start to monetize. In that moment that you start seeing the data soften out two, three, four, five, six months, you're going to get you know that real longer term turning in, pos- in, in positioning that um, would actually be an equities positive type of scenario. And I think, frankly, just very kind of anecdotally, people are, are, are really bearish right now. And that's kind of the final you know, spike of the football. Charlie, this is a fantastic conversation. We're not going to be able to get to all of the slides in your deck individually, but I want to really focus on what I took away from the rest of the deck in terms of the theme that it really speaks to me, and it's about liquidity. You talked earlier about what really drives markets. Is it stock or flow and so forth? And I'm very much of the opinion that, you know, as much as people love to talk about economic fundamentals and all that stuff that they study in universities, at the end of the day, what it comes down to is when there's more buyers than sellers, and it's a about liquidity. And some people think that that liquidity has been mostly provided as a result of monetary policy. Other people don't believe that that's what's driving it. But one thing that does seem to be clear is we don't have as much liquidity in markets as we used to. And a lot of your slides reflect that. What's going on here? What does it mean? And how should we interpret all of this? Yeah, so this is super relevant because it's been a major talking point in in recent weeks and, and, and months. And I think there is a kind of uh, amorphous understanding of this relationship between vol- volatility and, and, and liquidity, but specifically as it pertains to you know this larger discussion of the Fed's hawkish pivot, right? And this ten plus year regime change that we've been living under, easy financial conditions, loose financial conditions, almost the primary Fed mandate, right? That since they had to capitulate because of the inflation overshoot and move into inflation hawks, the equities market has been embedded for one of the longest periods I can remember in my career in a short gamma versus spot territory for dealers on account of this persistent short dated hedging demand from from clients. And really what that means is that you know this demand for downside hedges, this demand for this new regime, this demand into a tightening cycle, into higher real yields and tighter financial conditions, which are going to bleed really high valuation assets, both within equities and fixed income, and have caused this, you know, substantial netting down, and substantial slashing of longs, and substantial you know, degrossing at times, or, or you know, degrossing of, of longs and, and grossing up of short books has been, you know, this grab into short dated downside protection and short gamma creates accelerant flows as we've spoken about previously, right? Dealers end up needing to sell into moves lower. They need to buy into moves higher to remain neutral in their hedging. But also too, uh, and, and that amplifies volatility. That makes sense. And it's a two directional thing. It's not just when we trade lower. But it also magnifies this deteriorating market liquidity phenomenon because it is the primary driver of it. When, when dealers are in a long gamma regime, which was that short vol world that we lived in for the, you know, the 10 years prior, the decade prior, where you know, clients are selling options to dealers and we're stuffed with options and we're then long gamma. What that actually does is provide liquidity. We can post offers into market rallies, or conversely, we can bid into market sell-offs. That insulates the market against large swings. That suppresses volatility. It's insulation. It's a it's a vol stabilizer. But in a short gamma regime, dealers become liquidity takers. We're on the same side of the trade, so we're moving in the same direction with market momentum. 
We're selling into weakness. We're buying into strength. And that in turn exacerbates volatility. And that in turn becomes a huge notional source of liquidity removal from the market. And, you know, ultimately, when you are supposed to play this role of a uh, market maker, there are other matters in play here too. You cannot just simply be the liquidity provider of last resort if your risk management, if your P&L, if your hedging is obviously comes primary. And that is the largest input in my mind, why the market trades so broken and why liquidity or illiquidity is what it is right now. Charlie, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. Before I let you go, I want to ask you a little bit about your daily letter because I'll tell you, it's one of the most interesting things that crosses my desk every morning. Retail listeners, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Charlie does not make the compliance rules, but he does have to live by them. And Charlie's letter is only available to qualified institutional investors who have a relationship with Nomura. If you're an institutional investor and you have a relationship with Nomura, you're crazy if you are eligible and have not yet signed up for Charlie's free letter, which is every single morning and is always full of fascinating graphs and charts. Charlie, for people who are eligible, what do they need to do in order to get signed up? Sure. And, and appreciate it. Just make sure uh, you reach out to your Nomura Securities uh, sales contact and, uh, and we, can get, uh, we can get something worked out with regards to uh, being added to the distribution. Charlie, I really appreciate the interview, and we look forward to getting you back in coming months for another update. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. I've got a mind-blowing stat for you. The richest 1% own 43% of global wealth, and they're only getting richer. How are they doing it? By building smart, well-diversified portfolios and investing in blue-chip art. With little correlation to equities, art prices have outpaced the S&P 500 from 1995 through 2021, which means when the market goes down, a well-diversified art portfolio might not. It's no wonder that ultra-wealthy collectors invest 10 to 30% of their overall portfolios in blue-chip art. Now you can, too, with Masterworks. Masterworks is the billion-dollar alternative investing platform that allows you to add paintings from iconic artists like Banksy, Picasso, and Basquiat to your portfolio at an affordable entry point. Masterworks is giving my listeners priority access to their newest offerings. Start building an intelligent portfolio today at masterworks.art slash macrovoices. That's masterworks.art slash macrovoices. See important disclaimers at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Now back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was uh, great to have Charlie back on the show. Uh, just uh, love the way he goes and uh, analyzes the, the past historical references uh, and just a comparison to 2004 was pretty awesome. Well, what's happened since that interview, of course, is we had this crazy event overnight and boy, everything went one way hard, then the other way. What the heck is going on? Let's move on to our post-game chart deck. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, go to the homepage, macrovoices.com. Click the red button that says Looking for the Downloads. Patrick, the title of the deck is Did the Market Capitulate? Did the market capitulate? Well, uh, certainly did. Last week when we had the chart book, uh, we uh, showed uh, on page two the S&P 500 with that 200-day uh, moving average and just the fragility of where it was. And one of the things I was highlighting is that any legitimate breakdown below that kind of 4,400 level uh, had room for a downdraft toward 4,000. And uh, pretty much we got, I mean, we got uh, closer to 4,100. It didn't make it all the way to 4,000, but the that very aggressive kind of puke selling uh, uh, really did come about. And this time you could really feel the fear. Uh, in the prior parts of the selling, we didn't see those reactions in the dollar and bonds and and gold and, uh, and uh, oil the same way. And it seemed today that everything just had this enormous kind of like shit hit the fan moment that everyone just puked everything out. Uh, so with the S&P having this reversal, 
while it's very natural for us to get a bounce that could easily make it back to 4,300, even 4,400 back to that 200-day moving average is possible. So uh, in between Friday and Monday, if this was a short-term low, a couple hundred S&P points to the upside as, as volatility contracts and you get a, that kind of gamma tailwind back to the other side, uh, you could easily see a quick slingshot higher. But then when we get up there will be the real tell. If this was a legitimate bottom and a, a, and a meaningful buying opportunity, we should see sustained follow through uh, beyond that of uh, one or two trading days from an oversold market. And so while we probably do have a, a trading low that is of short term in nature, it's still very premature to, to be saying that it's uh, something more intermediate without more evidence. Patrick, I love page three in your deck. We had Russia basically attack and disable Ukraine's air defenses, take over the Chernobyl nuclear plant, and completely neutralize Ukraine's defensive military capabilities. The VIX is unchanged on the day. <laughs> there you go. I mean, I think the interesting part about the VIX, okay, so we did get that big spike, that 38. It was very similar to the level we got back in January. The interesting part of, of an S&P that could rally a couple hundred points, and you know Charlie referenced it throughout the interview as well, is, is that volatility because of the dealer uh, short gamma positioning could be just as volatile the other way. When we, if we saw volatility come back into the mid to low 20s by next week, that uh, becomes a short-term tailwind on the market to rebound. This is all very technical in nature. I don't think that the, the underpinning fundamental reasons why the stock market is in a bigger rotation aren't going to go away. But the thing is, is that I think on a short-term technical basis, there is lots of reason why the market could bounce here. Uh, overall, that may not be the end of the bigger sell cycle yet. But the fact that we saw this kind of a uh, pop and, and reversal in the VIX, it wouldn't shock me if we were in the mid to low 20s sometime next week. Patrick, let's take a look at the dollar index on page four. It looks like we got, oh boy, all the way up to 97 spots, 75 or so in the day, and they gave it back about half of it. Yeah. You know, the interesting part about this dollar move is going to be what happens in the next uh, uh, two or three trading sessions. Uh, I always like to say that uh, one day does not make a new trend. And we had a dollar that was almost completely inactive in the prior two weeks. And in just one day, we we had this big breakout that uh, tried to break to a higher high and just didn't follow through at this moment. And now, we could continue to see some follow through uh, between Friday and Monday, and it sustains at higher highs and starts a new trend. But if we see that the dollar index is gravitating back toward 96 by early to middle of next week, uh, this could have been one complete false start, and that trade range dollar will be right back in play. It'll be really interesting to see whether the bulls can hold the gains. Patrick, we've got the next three charts looking at gold. What's going on here? Well, let's just have a conversation. You already in the market wrap were referencing that pop and drop in gold and just wanted to give it some context here on, on page five. Obviously, uh, you're bang on with your levels. I think 1860 and even 1830 are going to be pretty important. Just generally, as gold here just pauses, so long as the bulls defend it and hold it at higher levels during a consolidation, it could still be a legitimate bull breakout. Uh, um, and so it'll be really important at this stage with the, that the bulls buy the dip here in the next couple of trading ses sessions to solidify this breakout. And that's going to be what I'm watching. But one of the interesting things on page six, which I wanted to highlight, was based on a conversation you and I were having, which was that while gold has broken out and has even worked its way higher, the interesting thing is that gold miners have generally been massive underperformers in many ways. And while the GDX, which represents the, the gold miner, 
miners, um, the more senior, larger gold miners, is relatively flat since uh, over the rolling 12-month basis. But the small cap junior gold miners were down quite considerably, down uh, at 1.25%. But that doesn't even reflect uh, some of the individual gold names. There's some great gold miners out there that in some cases were down 30, 40, 50% over this cycle. And the interesting thing is, is that even though gold broke out, not all of these miners have moved yet. And we, we're still seeing that no one has really kind of bought in that some new big trend has begun yet. It would be interesting to see whether or not the gold miners start to catch up or whether the, uh, the bullion trade is just a fake out. Patrick, the reason that I wanted to include this chart today was it looked like we were going to close with gold up around 1970 or so. And what I was going to say is if you missed the boat and you missed the upside on gold and you, you want to get in after the fact, the way to do it is the mining stocks because they haven't caught up yet. And uh, presumably they would catch up. I think what we have to do is wait and see what's going to happen with the trend in gold itself. Now, this does look like a big reversal candle today, but don't forget that late in the day, uh, President Biden vowed that U.S. forces are not going to fight in Ukraine. And the implication there is that means military action is not going to be taken by the United States. And that causes everybody who was afraid of this escalating to World War III to take a, a big deep breath. Um, hang on. I think what he's really communicating here is U.S. soldiers are not going to be boots on the ground in Ukraine. That doesn't necessarily mean that we can't see other forms of military escalation, such as U.S. airstrikes and so forth. Now, I haven't read the full U.S. Uh, statement. I'm not sure exactly what was said, but I think we need to find out whether it was a reaction to that statement that caused everything to reverse today, or if this truly was a, a buy the rumor, sell the news type of event, or what's going on here. But uh, clearly, and you know, not even just GDXJ, but if you look, as you said, at some of the individual issues, stocks like Osisco and uh, Equinox are down 40% plus. And I'm not aware of any special fundamentals or anything that's gone wrong with the management of those companies. It's just that illiquid small junior mining stocks have been incredibly out of favor, and I think there's a lot of bargains out there. So the bargains are, are in the junior miners uh, if we believe that this trend up in gold is going to be sustained. Now, I felt pretty darn confident about it, but today's reversal candle is a little bit scary to look at on the chart. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I wanted to just add a supporting chart to that argument. If you go to page seven and you look at the uh, gold miners bullish percentage index, uh, what you can observe here is, is that uh, numerous times we see some incredibly oversold and overbought conditions when you look at the entire gold mining space altogether. And we, we obviously saw some incredibly oversold gold mining conditions going into the tail end of last year where we had... Uh, uh, you know, only 20% of stocks actually on the miners giving bullish signals, which is a pretty oversold condition. Uh, what you can observe here, even with this breakout in gold, um, we're not anywhere near over 50%. If there is going to be an emergent trend here, it hasn't even really begun. And so this is why it's such an interesting space to watch whether or not it can follow through, because there's probably a lot of upside here in the miners if this bull trend can uh, actually go. But anyway, Eric, I wanted to move on to page eight and just really show that chart on crude oil and the way that pop and drop occurred on that candle. I'm actually so surprised to just see such an enormous intraday reversal. Now, usually this kind of volatility can happen over several days, but I mean, just to happen literally within a span of six hours from the top to bottom, just uh, running up and then running back down, just amazing move, isn't it? Well, here's what I think might explain that, Patrick. Of course, the big move up was the fear of, here we go, if the U.S. gets into a war with Russia, or if the U.S. imposes oil-related sanctions on Russia, 
boy, oh boy, the crude oil market just cannot tolerate the loss of Russian production. But hang on. Now the sanctions have been announced. Biden has said U.S. forces will not fight in Ukraine. To me, that statement is a little bit ambiguous as to whether it means that U.S. airstrikes will not occur in Ukraine as well. Uh, But one way or another, there aren't any oil-related sanctions, and the other sanctions have been announced. So it seems pretty clear that the White House strategy is to find ways to sanction Russia that do not impact energy prices, because obviously they're very concerned about energy prices. And I think that That probably explains a lot of the reversal. Now, I still think that for reasons that have nothing to do with Russia and Ukraine, that we're headed higher on oil prices. But we've come awfully high, awfully fast on this Russia fear. And if what we're seeing is the market recognizing that, yes, the Biden administration is going to be aggressive with sanctioning Russia, but it's not going to be energy related sanctions. Maybe that's the reason that we had such a big reversal candle today. And maybe there's still more downside to come. Uh, I think that that's a buy the dip opportunity, though. The question is, how much more downside is there before that buy the dip? We're going to have to see how things pan out in the next few days. Oh, for sure. But what I wanted to interestingly highlight on page nine is when we look at the actual energy companies, what I thought was really interesting was that um, the energy stocks, the ETFs that, uh, in the different basket, whether oil services or exploration or those uh, fully integrated large cap ones, while oil was ripping to 100, there was some very active profit taking in this space. And many of these energy names were actually down on the day while oil was ripping higher. I thought that was an uh, extraordinary divergence. And one of the interesting things about that was when you look at this bullish percentage index, we saw us hitting 100% again uh, just a, a few weeks ago. And what we're already down to is 76%. There seems to be quietly some active profit taking that's starting to happen in energy stocks while oil is holding up. Now, I don't know if I want to overread into this just uh, too soon, but it does seem like the energy companies have lost a lot more momentum than oil itself. And I wonder whether that actually is something that we should be reading into or whether it's just the, the energy stocks were a little overdone and will eventually catch up. And Patrick, we can see uranium moving up on page 10. Yeah, you know, interesting. Obviously, um, uh, a lot of uh, uranium comes from that part of the uh, world where uh, Russia resides. And a lot of that political uncertainty has certainly on the short term upticked some uranium. It'll be interesting to see. Uranium has been incredibly quiet for the last six months, trading in a sideways consolidation, just using the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust as a, a proxy on the price of uranium. It'll be really interesting to see whether whether uranium prices on this actually start to rise and whether this in itself can actually become bullish for the space. Well, Eric, though, I wanted to move on to the chart of wheat on page 11. And really what was interesting is obviously Ukraine supplies a lot of, uh, of these uh, grain products. And while I showed the chart of, of wheat, uh, the prices of corn and soybean have just been ripping. It's been a huge reaction in the last few days. But what I thought was the most interesting about this is that uh, that wheat and these grains have not given back the gains the way gold and oil did. And I thought that was interesting, the fact that these are actually holding up. And I wonder whether that actually means that there's more upside on these. I don't claim to understand what's going on here, but just taking a guess, Patrick, I think what may be going on is that the Biden administration, although I'm not aware of any wheat or other grain related sanctions being announced, they seem to be focusing on non-energy related sanctions. So a lot of wheat and other grains get grown in Russia and in Ukraine. And uh, if they're going to target something for economic sanctions, it seems like it's not going to be energy. So it's going to be other things. Maybe that's what's driving the grains up. That's just a guess. Let's move on to page 12. Where we've got investment grade corporate bond spreads. What's going on? Well, you know, I just wanted to keep highlighting that uh, that while we have seen these reversals in the markets on an intraday basis, the one thing that we continue to see 
is that credit spreads continue to rise. And while they have not in any way blown out to levels that we have seen like during the COVID events or other things like that that have caused a lot of stresses in the market, they are generally trending higher. And I think before we, uh, like right now, while the stock market might be overdue for an oversold reaction to the upside, I think that in order to have a more sustained rally in the markets, I think that a lot of the credit risks need to subside. And at least initially, we're not seeing that happening yet. And so uh, this is something that I think I'm going to keep watching over the next week or two. Listeners, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. Patrick's service information is on slides 13 and 14 or at bigpicturetrading.com. We're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better serve the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Masterworks, the billion-dollar alternative investment platform that lets you invest in art by legends like Warhol and Picasso for a fraction of the cost. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. Well, this week you're going to find the transcript for today's interview as well as a link to Charlie's slide deck as well as a chart book we just discussed in the post game. There's also a number of links to some articles we found really interesting. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners. And we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend. That's Eric spelt with a K and myself at Patrick Ceresna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.